What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. So, man, it's Nicholas. BDG, big dogs got a fantasy football. <clears throat> I come to you today humbled. I'm upset, disheveled, disgraced, embarrassed, depressed, clinically depressed, probably. Your man's did not have a good week 15. Like, really fucking bad, actually. Yo, fuck Aaron Jones. Fuck you, Philip Lindsay. Travis Kelsey, you could sit on it too. I forget who else was on my team, but everybody sucked. But <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you guys did well, and I'm happy to hear that, all right? I'm happy to hear that you guys did well. I'm not going to hold the grudge against you because my teams decide to shit the fucking bed in week 15 after having a fantastic fucking regular season. <clears throat> but that's showbiz, baby. Let's get it. Week 15, waiver, wire, pickups. How y'all gonna win your championship when Aaron Jones is no longer playing? Karrion Johnson is out of the fucking picture. Patrick Mahomes is putting up 14 fantasy points after putting up 48 fantasy points a game. Oh, just play the goddamn intro music. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I've collected myself. As per usual, it's, it's Monday evening and uh, this is the week 15 waiver wire pickup or the week 16 waiver wire pickup I should say week 15 is in the books except for the Monday night football game tonight which is the Saints versus Panthers and I'm really really could give a shit less about it but waiver wire everyone on this list is owned in 55% or fewer of Yahoo leagues as for the streaming positions, quarterback, tight end, and defense, as I have been doing for the last few weeks, there is a downloadable chart in the description. It will be the first link down below that will tell you my favorite quarterbacks, tight ends, defensive streams of the week, as well as things like the over-under, um, the spreads of the games, and uh, and things like that. So it's a little bit more detailed. First link in the description. We're only going to talk about skill players. We're going to talk about running backs. We're going to talk about wide receivers. We are going to start off with the ball carriers. And the first one on this list, the biggest name is, of course, Jamal Williams of the Green Bay Packers. This is barring, we don't know anything about the Todd Gurley injury, but we'll get to that. Jamal Williams, 17% owned, very widely available, could be a league winner. Given that a lot of my fantasy playoff matchups uh, were riding on Aaron Jones, it was only natural that, of course, he left the game within about eight seconds due to a... Uh, due to sprained MCL, and he's going to be out for the rest of the year for, well, probably for the rest of the year. He's absolutely out for Week 16's matchup against the Jets. The Jets, the Jets, the Jets, the Jets. So we enter Jamal Williams, and we finally have this fantasy football season coming full circle, right? We started the year off telling people to draft Jamal Williams because he was going to get the first crack. He was going to get the, he was going to be the featured workhorse, right? If you look at it from a bird's eye view, you know, you look at the beginning of the season, oh, Jamal Williams is going to be the featured workhorse. You, you um, look at the, the end of the season, Jamal Williams is going to be the featured workhorse in Green Bay. What could have gone wrong in between weeks one and weeks 16? What could have gone right for Jamal Williams, to be honest with you? But that's neither here nor here. Jamal Williams is going to be the guy in week 16. He is going to be the guy and the only guy there. With Jones out last week, uh, Williams took over that backfield completely. He ran the ball 12 times for 55 yards and a touchdown. He caught four of his five targets for another 42 yards, getting involved heavily on the ground, getting involved by the goal line, getting involved in the passing game. Obviously, they don't have Ty Montgomery anymore. This was, honestly, this was the best game his fat ass has had since sometime last year. So it's been a long time. Um, after Jones left, Williams literally saw 100% of the backfield touches um, the snaps, the carries, the targets, the receptions, the yardage. It was him. It is all him and nothing but the him. Sir, the Jets, who they play in Week 16, they're at New York, um, have been okay against running backs, mediocre in terms of fantasy purposes. They've led up their share of big games. And interestingly enough, I was looking at the names in which they have given up big games to, and they have similar styles to Jay Willie. Jay Willie the God. Throw some respect on him. Speaking of the God... They let up a, a 10 for 40 in a touchdown game against Derrick Henry. Sonny Michelle went 21 for 133 in a touchdown. Jordan Howard, 20 for 81 in a touchdown. Latavius Murray, 15 for 69 and two touchdowns. Carlos Hyde, 23, 98 and two touchdowns. So all guys that are a little thicker, multiple C's in the thickness range, um, similar to Jamal Williams. So we've seen them have success. There's no reason why we can't see a guy like Jamal Williams having success as a volume-based High-end RB2 right now with definite RB1 top 10 kind of fantasy upside. So Jamal Williams would be my number one pickup for the week. Again, this list is in order of the Yahoo ownership. So this is not necessarily in order of guys I like the most. 
Second running back on this list is going to be Mike Davis of the Seattle Seahawks, 17% owned. Now, I ain't excited about Mike Davis, really. Chris Carson has, has just been an absolute god this year. But as long as the, the Seahawks are set on giving their running backs like 849 touches a game, Chris Carson is going to eat, but so is whoever their RB2 is. And considering Rashad Penny is banged up, he missed last week's game or this Sunday's game. Kind of surprised. I feel like he was kind of a surprise and active. Um, well, he missed this game. We don't know if he's going to be ready for next week. Mike Davis filled in. And whoever is at RB2 is on a week-over-week basis getting a, a decent amount of touches. Now, he only carried the ball five times. Chris Carson carried the ball, you know, around that 20 mark, which is what we could probably expect. Mike Davis caught eight targets. He caught all eight of his targets. Um, for 63 yards. Now, Davis has looked like the top pass catching option in this backfield pretty much all year now. And he's had like three or four big receiving games separately throughout the year. So we've seen him do it over and over again. And they're clearly comfortable using him on the, uh, you know, in the, in the passing game here. So again, this is going to be dependent on Rashad Penny's health. If Penny misses time, there's a chance that Davis is even more involved in week 16, considering they are playing the Chiefs and they might need to pass the ball, ball a little more um, than they normally would as a team because... The Chiefs score the ball a little more than typical teams that they would face against. So keep an eye on Penny reports, Mike Davis. And this is a lot, you know, this is more so towards people who are kind of desperate at this point. I'm in a 14 team league in which I needed to start, like, who is it? I, I think I started Darren Sproles as a in an RB spot this week. But if you're in a deeper league, these things happen, right? Because there are guys like Melvin Gordon and James Conner and, you know, all these guys miss time. So you have to fill in with other guys. So Mike Davis has definitely got to keep an eye on. Third guy on this list is John Kelly of the Los Angeles Rams. 4% owned, and this is completely up to whether or not Todd Gurley is going to be healthy or not. Todd Gurley left the game on Sunday, and he ended up returning, right? He was on, on the side with uh, icing his knee and whatever. So people were freaking out, of course. Todd Gurley did enter. He did finish the game, but you could see that they were kind of favoring going elsewhere. They didn't really want to keep feeding Gurley, and they kind of shied away, which tells you that maybe it's a little bit serious. Maybe it's not. My thinking is that if you could finish the game, you could probably play in the next week's game. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't, they get a week 16 matchup against Arizona where they should dominate game script and Arizona's horrible against running backs as we just saw Tevin Coleman tear him up obviously because fucking the Falcons are the worst team in the fucking NFL all year basically right Tevin Coleman sucks Matt Ryan sucks Patrick Peterson shuts down opposing wide receivers the Atlanta defense is literally the worst NFL defense all year long but not on Sunday not on Sunday on Sunday the Falcons defense was the Jacksonville 2017 defense and Julio Jones and Patrick Peterson was nowhere to be found because I was playing against Matt, Matt Ryan turns into fucking Cam Newton getting rushing touchdowns and shit you know why it was because I was playing against Matt Ryan and Julio Jones and the Atlanta Falcons defense which scored Joe fuck you Joe if you're listening to this like 75 points between the three of them I never had a chance I never had a fucking chance I forget what I was even saying. If Gurley misses time, they're probably going to split the backfield between John Kelly, who was a seventh round rookie pick this year, and Justin Davis. Now, I don't really know much about Justin Davis, but I know John Kelly because he was someone that I had my eye on throughout the preseason. He was someone who popped throughout the preseason, and he was someone, very importantly, on, um, on this guy named Graham Barfield's yards created favorite list. Now, Graham Barfield is one of the better fantasy football analysts in all of thy kingdom. If you don't know who Graham Barfield is, go on Twitter, go follow him on Twitter, or just search him on Google, whatever. He does this column every year called Yards Created, in which it's my favorite resource for, I guess, researching and or familiarizing yourself with the incoming rookie running back class. And John Kelly stood out as one of his absolute favorite guys in this class. And uh, when we saw him in preseason, we we saw a lot of that. The re like he's he's a guy that didn't get a lot of hype because he's not a speed not a metric guy right his speed is not good he's not like really big right you don't look at him and be like oh great running back he's one of those guys like Dalvin Cook or Kareem Hunt who doesn't have the metrics but they have balance and they have quickness and they're shifty and you know they have a good um, balance of like speed and strength and all these things as well as vision right and it's all these underrated things that make running backs good in the NFL that we have today. John Kelly's one of those guys. So he would be my top guy to add here. I feel like they're probably going to split up the backfield between multiple guys. Um, but if there's one to own, my pick would be John Kelly. Uh, but you'll have to keep a really close eye on what happens with Todd Gurley. The fourth running back on this list and the last guy on this list that I'm going to talk about is Kalen Balage of the Miami Dolphins 1% owned. Available everywhere in all Yahoo leagues. First, want to say rest in peace to Frank Gore. The triple OG, double OG, Frank Gore. Somehow, without Gore, it's possible that Kenyon Drake becomes even more of an unreliable fantasy option than with Gore. Absolutely 
incredulous. Makes no fucking sense. Fantasy football makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But here are the big facts. Gore was carted off the field, taken to the locker room with his uh, with, with what is now being called a sprained foot. We have since heard reports. Actually, I want to talk about the sprained foot thing. Like, I don't really know what a sprain is, I guess. When I think of a sprain, I think of like a, like a slinky, right? Like the... Like something that wraps around, or like a you, you know like um, like a bike that has shocks, the thing that swirls around or whatever. I kind of imagine a sprain is like that, but kind of like twisting. You know what I mean? And uh, and I don't know why the fuck I think about that. I don't know why I think that's what a sprain is. But then I try to imagine that inside a foot, and I'm like, there's nothing inside your foot that looks like that. So what? How can you sprain your foot? I don't know. Obviously, I'm wrong here. Like I'm I'm just a doctor, so you know, don't take my word for it. Oh, please explain explain to me what a sprained foot is. Anyways, anyways, going off on a lot of tangents today. I'm riled up. We got the E-Town Get Down weekly recap video tonight. We're filming after I film this in a couple hours. So I got to keep the energy levels high. It's going to be hard for me to do. I'm, I'm, I'm pissed right now. Gord is going to be out for the remainder of 2018. When he left Sunday's game, nothing changed when it came to Kenyon Drake. Looking at this tweet from Adam Leviton, right? No real role change for Kenyon Drake, even in wake of Frank Gore's foot injury. Kalen Balazs, 12 carries, one target, 26 snaps. Drake, one carry, three targets, 28 snaps. The fourth round rookie, Kalen Balaj, saw 13 opportunities compared to just four for Drake. Drake outsnapped him 28 to 26. Balaj went nuts. He broke off a 75 yard touchdown round. He turned 12 carries into 123 yards and a score. He didn't do anything in the receiving game, but that is one of his, that was probably his only strong point coming out of college. Everyone was really excited for him as a receiver because he's almost, he almost is like literally a receiver coming out of the backfield. Balaj really surprised me. He looked a lot better than I thought he would, especially against a tough Minnesota run defense. For the most part, he was kind of blown up in the backfield because the Minnesota defense was swarming. They had no real holes for him. He did break off a 75 yard touchdown run. And that is absolutely part of his repertoire of things that he can do at any given time. Um, because if you look at Kalen Balaj, he is a 96th percentile weight adjusted speed score athlete. 446 for someone who runs um, or someone who weighs 230 pounds at 6'2 is a ridiculous blend of size and speed. So those things can happen throughout the game. And he looked a little shiftier and he looked a little more nimble than I had expected him to look. Thing was, he was never a workhorse in college. He was never someone who got a lot of carries. So that's like a big problem in today's you know, analysis world is people just want to, like, you can't, like, why is he just going to be good at football, even though he's never proven that he's good at football? I'm not saying that's the case for Balazs, but that's a lot of the analysis that goes behind it nowadays. Anyways, Balazs looked really good. He really surprised me and he broke out. That being said, they do play Jacksonville next week at home. So that's not exactly an easy matchup. While Jacksonville has been terrible this year, their defense is still good against running backs. They're not letting up a ton of points to opposing running backs. And we have no idea what we're really going to get from this backfield in terms of Miami on a given week, right? Drake could suddenly get 15 touches next week or fucking Brandon Bolden can break off two touchdown runs like who really knows Caleb Blasch absolutely looked good and he was clearly like the workhorse here above Ken Drake once Frank Gore left so if I had to guess yeah Blasch is definitely going to get a shot you know they're they're out of it he was their fourth round pick and there was a lot of hype about him in the preseason from the Miami camp so clearly they're going to want to see what they have here and see what he could actually do um, so he's a flyer for sure, but he's more someone that I just kind of want to put on your radar for 2019 and going into the offseason. So um, he's someone to look out for because obviously Frank Gore is not going to be a big part of their plans next year. Clearly, they don't they don't want to fucking give Kenyon Drake the ball. So I doubt he's going to be a big part of their plans either. Those are the top running backs for me for this week. Before we get into the wide receivers, make sure you check out BigDogFantasy.com where we got the new hats back in stock. We got the khaki flavor. We got black flavor licorice. With the white stitching. Uh, these are actually pretty fucking beautiful. I'm actually really happy these turned out. Uh, I also want to thank today's sponsor for your video. I mean, these couldn't come in at a better time considering it is playoffs. It is championship week. Y'all, make sure you snag some gear for FantasyJocks.com. Make sure your champion has a belt to fucking boast around. Make sure you got a ring. I got a championship ring somewhere up in here. I don't know where it went, to be honest with you. Oh, here it is. We got the Rangalang. We have, they have trophies on there. You can get the engravements of your team's names, your past winners, all of that good stuff. Y'all, it is championship week. Go make sure you step your league's game up. Fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 to take 10% off your purchase. Don't say your mans never did nothing for you. Thank you, fantasyjocks.com. Let's talk about pass catchers because this is actually a good week to need pass catchers, right? There are a lot of good pass catchers available in fantasy football leagues. First up is Josh Reynolds of the Rams, 53% owned, so 47% available, about open in 50-50% of the leagues. 
Cooper Cup's last game that he played in was in week 10. From weeks 11 through this Sunday, through week 15, so 11 to week 15, Josh Reynolds has had nearly an 18% target share on this Rams offense, and he's coming off a 12-target game on Sunday. Now, he hasn't been great in terms of production. I understand that, and I don't think he's a fantastic receiver by any means. Um, But this offense is no longer really blowing teams out, and Gurley is banged up. We don't know if we're going to see him uh, in Week 16, so we don't know if this is necessarily going to be a ground-heavy game plan. They've really gotten away from that after Gurley was getting so many touches earlier on in the year. So, um, you know, them not being such a prolific offense and them not using the ground game so much kind of tends to favor a guy like Josh Reynolds and, and just the passing game in general from a statistic standpoint. They get a game at Arizona in Week 16. And there's a good chance that we see Patrick Peterson, who I I guess isn't even a good cornerback anymore, apparently. But I guess I'm not playing in week 16, so Patrick Peterson will go back to being an absolute stud. He's either going to take away Robert Woods or Brandon Cooks in this game, leaving Reynolds as one of Goff's better matchups in terms of, you know, defense versus offense. So I think he's uh, he's in play for a wide receiver three flex role in your fantasy lineups if uh, if you need somebody, right? 12 targets is a big, a big, 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 big number. Speaking of big, speaking of big, big things, big things, big things from Pettis was a was a was a draft pick of the Niners this year, rookie wide receiver who Shanahan traded up for to acquire. He's been an animal since he's taken over the full time role of outside receiver in San Francisco since week twelve. He is fifty two percent owned, and this is something I tweeted out earlier today. I don't have to mind the first part, but Adam Thielen's been trash. Dante Pettis has been really good. So my logic behind it was that maybe he just stole his fucking powers. I don't know. Maybe that's fake news. Maybe that's real news. Because Pettis has uh, taken over as a full-time player there. He did that in week 12. That's when he started getting, you know, 85 to 90% of the snaps in this offense. Starting in week 12. Seven targets, four catches, 77 yards, and a touchdown. Week 13, five catches, 129 yards, two touchdowns. Week 14, three catches, 49 yards, and a tutty. Sunday, five catches, 83 yards. So he has been at 83 yards and or receiving touchdown in four straight games. He hadn't played more than 56 snaps in a game this entire season prior to week 12. Week 12 and beyond the last four games, he has played in more than 56 snaps in every single one of those games. And he's done these productive, you know, things against pretty tough opponents, right? Seattle twice, once on the road, Denver, who's without Chris Harris, but they still have a tough outside pass defense, in my opinion. Uh, Tampa Bay, who have been improved, if nothing else, and they were at Tampa Bay, so the road game's a little tougher too. I don't want to, you know, put too much analysis on that. But tougher opponents, and he's done it in four straight games, right? Consistency, production, all of the above. And the opportunity is there. Unfortunately, the sledding doesn't really get any easier in Week 16, the championship matchup against Chicago. But um, while the cornerbacks have been good, they're definitely by no means like a shutdown. You, You can't play any of your wide receivers against the Chicago Bears. You don't have to completely fade them. So I think that Dante Pettis is definitely a worthy flex option in Week 16, just riding this roller coaster. Third guy on this list, Mike Williams of the Los Angeles Chargers, 51% owned. Williams exploded on Thursday Night Football against the Chiefs. Shout out to, actually, you know what? I'm done. I'm done crucifying my team. I'm sorry. Thursday Night Football against the Chiefs. Williams finished the game with three tuggers. One by way of rushing. Rushing a 19-yard touchdown. He also caught two touchdowns. Caught seven of nine targets, 76 yards. Finished with three total touchdowns, as well as a walk-off two-point conversion. Shout out to Chargers, Joe. What a fucking win. What a great game. Keenan Allen missing the entire second half. Some of the first half will explain probably a lot of the volume and the playtime that Mike Williams got in this one. But Williams looked good, man. Even dominant at times throughout that game. Now, Allen is dealing with this hip injury, right? However, it's not supposed to be that serious. Basically, everything I've seen so far, news reports on Twitter, are that he has a very, very, very legitimate chance at suiting up on Saturday. Or at, on Sunday when they play now. Actually, is, are they on a Saturday game? Let me check the schedule real quick. Um, so Keenan Allen supposedly has a very real chance of returning to the Chargers lineup this week, not missing any time. And we should expect Melvin Gordon to be back, so they probably will go a little more run heavy than they have been the last few games. Yeah, they do play on Saturday. Okay, so they even they have a day less to rest, although um, they played on Thursday night. So he's had like nine days to rest up for that Chargers matchup in week 16. Anyways, Keenan Allen, you know, he's expected to suit up. However, I I think he might be at less than 100% because they do need a win, man. They're in a, a crucial playoff spot fighting for, you know, not only the division, the number one seed, all that good stuff. So they might push Allen to play even if he is less than 100%. Tough matchup versus Baltimore. 
Um, if count if Keenan Allen is out, obviously that's a huge boost for Mike Williams. If Allen is in though, it becomes a little bit more difficult to project Williams, or at least a little bit more difficult for me to get excited about Mike Williams, right? Thursday Night Football, this previous game was the first time that Williams has gone over 75 receiving yards since week two this year. He scored fewer than seven half-point PPR fantasy points in four of the previous six games that he has played in. Sure, it would make sense for them to play him more and, and starting to get him more time on the field, but I'm not sure we're actually going to see that if Keenan Allen is there, right? He should be playing more. He should be playing more. I understand that. I'm not arguing the fact that Tyrell Williams is better than Mike Williams. I'm not arguing that. That's just the way that things have gone, right? Don't kill the messenger. I'm just literally giving you the big facts of the situation here. Williams has played on over 70% of the team snaps literally twice this entire year. He has not played more than 70% of the team snaps more than twice. They came in week 12 and this previous game in week 15 when Keenan Allen was hurt. 70% of the snaps twice all year. In those two games though, in week 12, he caught four passes, 25 yards, but he found pay dirt, two tuggers, two touchdowns. And then obviously on week 15, um, Thursday night football, he exploded. So in between those two games though, right? Played over 70% of the snaps week 12. Then he played 54% of the snaps and then 51% of the snaps before playing a lot of the snaps on Thursday night football. So you don't know what you're going to get and you are playing against Baltimore. So it's not, it's not all of a sudden just becomes an easy matchup for Mike Williams. I just think you need to slow your roll if you're getting really excited about Mike Williams, if Keenan Allen is, in fact, in the lineup. This doesn't all of a sudden turn into uh, an automatic, you know, Williams fucking hit. This is not a lock for him to throw up huge fantasy numbers for you, right? I'm just saying be cautious. And I know the fact that now I'm saying Mike Williams is a fade for this week automatically means he's going to fucking hit. So fire Mike Williams up in all your lineups, guaranteed fantasy football championships, because you just got to fade your boy at this point. That's all I got to say about fucking Mike Williams. Robbie Anderson is next up on this list, 26% owned. He now has seven or more targets in three straight games, and he's become Sam Darnold's clear number one target in this offense. On Sunday, he caught seven of 11 targets for 96 yards and a tutty, uh, and that was a week after he went four for 76 and a tutty. Over these last three games in which he's had these target numbers, his average depth of target, his A dot, is pretty has been pretty fucking remarkable. It's nearly 19 yards average depth of target which is the fourth highest in the NFL over that three-game span of wide receivers who have seen eight-plus targets. So for someone getting this many targets, right, you're getting seven a game with an average depth of target of 19 fucking yards. You're getting a lot of targets, a lot of long targets. The production is going to be there consistently if you're going to keep getting those chances. And Robbie Anderson is obviously a playmaker when it comes to down-the-field passes. And he's done this at Tennessee at Buffalo against Houston. So it's tough passing matchups. They're not an easy easy matchup for him to do this. So um, they get Green Bay in week 15. Now they're not exactly an easy matchup, but they'll be at home. And this is a deflated Packers team, right? They're banged up. Their defense plays far inferior when they're on the road as compared to when they're at Lambeau. So I actually really like Robbie Anderson in week 16 as a fill-in. Moving on down the list, we got Deshaun Hamilton, Denver Broncos, 22% owned. Checking out this tweet from your man's Adam Leviton. Denver wide receiver targets in the two games since Manny Sanders' injury. Deshaun Hamilton leads them with 21. Tim Patrick, second with 18. Cortland Sutton, 12. This is really all that needs to be said about the wide receiver situation here. Sutton stinks, bro. Fucking Courtney Sutton out here. Tim Patrick looks good. Hamilton is producing at a high level because of the volume is uh the, the production isn't necessarily there but the volume is he's seen 21 targets like he said over the last two games which is a 23.3 percent target share from case keenum this is something we've consistently seen from whoever is in the slot he is running 75 percent of his routes from the slot he has turned those 21 targets into 14 catches for only 93 yards over the last two weeks but he's a good ppr play of course they get the oakland Raiders in week 16. They're at Oakland. This defense has been a free-for-all over the middle as of recently when it comes to slot receivers pretty much, right? Last week, they gave up four for 38 and a touchdown to Tyler Boyd before he left the game and got hurt on Sunday. Two weeks ago, Juju Smith-Schuster went fucking nuts. Eight for 130 and two touchdowns. A week before that, it was Kansas City, but I like, honestly, does fucking Kansas City even have a slot receiver? I feel like they don't even have a slot receiver. Um, but Travis Kelsey went nuts. That was the week that Travis Kelsey went for like Fucking 35 fantasy points, three touchdowns, yada, yada, yada. Absolutely obliterated them. So I really like Deshaun Hamilton's spot right here. Um, I think this is probably the time where he breaks that touchdown streak. I think he continues the high target number just based on how K Case Keenum does his passing. And Oakland's been very susceptible to playmakers over the middle. So I like Deshaun Hamilton in week 16. The last guy I just want to kind of throw 
name out here. Um, just to give him a shout out, to be honest with you, because he's been a fucking beast. That's Robert Foster of the Buffalo Bills, 13% owned. If you don't know who Robert Foster is, good, because you're a normal fucking person, because no one should actually know who Robert Foster is. But for those of you who don't know who Robert Foster is, he is, he's been a fucking beast over the last five weeks. I think I said that like six times already, but looking at his numbers, right? From weeks 10 to 15, last five games he's played in, four targets, Three catches, 105 yards. Two catches, 94 yards, and a touchdown. Week 13, he only went one for 27, but that was the week Zay Jones went four for 67, two touchdowns. Um, week 14, seven catches, 104 yards. Week 15, four catches, 108 yards, and a touchdown. So in his last five games, he's gone over 100 yards in three of them. He's gone over 94 yards in four of them, and he has scored twice. So he's been really fucking good. And I found, I was looking on uh, Pro Football Focus, he is leading the NFL in receptions of 40 plus yards over the last seven weeks. He has four of them. I'm pretty sure he has four of them over these last five weeks, but the record just happens to extend over that long because no one else is making plays like the man, Robert Foster. This is his player profiler profile. Um, he's not necessarily big. 6'2 is good height though. He comes from Alabama. He is 25 years old. Didn't have much production in college, but if you look at the speed, that's probably what explains his... Uh, 40 plus yard reception numbers aligned with Josh Allen, who has that big arm, of course, 441 speed puts him in the 83rd percentile for weight adjusted speed score. The rest of the numbers aren't great, but he's been really good, man. Um, they play at new England. Obviously they're going to have to score to keep up against the Patriots who I believe are 14 or 15 point favorites in this one. Uh, honestly, bro, if you ain't starting Robert Foster over Tyree kill, you're really doing fantasy football wrong. You really are. I mean that, and I'm dead serious when I say that, too. Like, I'm so serious. Don't ask me if I'm serious down in the comments. <sighs> I'm depressed. I'm fucking depressed. I can't believe how good my team was in the E-Town Get Down, and now I just fucking throw up a dud in, in the first round of the playoffs. Good times. Good times. That's all I got for you today, guys. Uh, if you want the quarterback, tight end, defensive streaming options, it'll be the first link down below. If you followed along for this long, if I helped you get to the playoffs, if I helped you get to the chip, even if you fucking lost 18 weeks ago, whatever, please hit a thumbs up down below with the little thing that looks like that. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're on the podcast or rating and review, if this is the last time you're going to be listening to the podcast, man, if I helped you out all year, it would be really greatly appreciated if you left a rating and review and any engagement, any comment, anything, literally anything, honestly, will probably make me feel better than I do at this point. So that's all I got to say. I'm out. Peace.